Did you know that the image of Angkor Wat, one of the most splendid temples in the world, decorates the national flag of modern-day Cambodia? Cambodia is one of the few countries to have an image of a building on its national flag, but such a thing comes naturally to this Southeast Asian country. Angkor is their heritage, their birthright, and a crucial component of their national identity. Between the 9th and 15th centuries, Angkor was the center of the Khmer Empire. The Khmer Empire, also known as the Empire of Angkor, was not an empire in the modern sense of the word. It can hardly be called a kingdom in Western terms. It is a designation given to the Khmer civilization that prospered between the 9th and 15th centuries to differentiate it from other periods of Cambodian history. The Khmer Empire was a complex civilization with the kings at the very top of society. The people warred with the neighboring tribes, worked their land and grew rice, and were builders responsible for the elaborate complexes of temples and monuments. The Khmer Empire was a nation of slaves and rulers, Hindus and Buddhists, tradition and innovative engineering. Indeed, the Khmer people of the Empire of Angkor were a paradoxical entity. Before we talk about Angkor Wat, let us start with the person who began its construction in the 12th century. Cambodia's latter years of the 11th century were marked by a constant turmoil and a fight for power. At some moments, three kings claimed to be the absolute ruler simultaneously. Suryavarman II, the man who would later establish the foundations of Angkor Wat, came to power after a period of disorder, fragmentation, and internal rebellions. Suryavarman established diplomatic relations with China. The first embassy was sent to the Song court in 1116 where the trade details between the two nations were discussed. The embassy stayed in China for only one year, but two more were sent in 1120 and 1128. One of the Chinese texts mentioned that the Cambodian king was a great Chinese vassal. Surya Varman warred against Vietnam and Champa because he was persuaded to do so by the Chinese. However, it is unclear if Surya Varman ever considered himself a servant to the Song dynasty. After all, it is no secret the Chinese emperors thought the whole world was under their vassalage. In 1128, he sent around 20,000 soldiers in an attack on Dai Viet, a Vietnamese kingdom. Sir Yavarman was defeated and had to flee for his life. His subsequent attempts in 1132 and 1145 yielded failures as well. Sir Yavarman made one last attempt in 1150. He was defeated and had to withdraw his conquered army back to Cambodia. While these expeditions were largely unsuccessful and the territory he gained was not much at all, they did bring new people under his control, people who would be used as a workforce behind his great building projects. Surya Varman II did not want to be associated with his immediate predecessors, so he turned to Vishnu, making him the supreme deity instead of the previously worshipped Shiva. The king built some of the most impressive temples in northeastern Thailand, such as Phi Mai and Phanom Rung. His devotion to Vishnu inspired him to erect the largest and most beautiful of all Cambodian temples, Angkor Wat. But Angkor Wat was more than just a temple. It was a monument, a tomb, and an observatory. Today, it is one of the most visited places in the world, attracting over 2.6 million people each year. Angkor Wat, built in the 12th century as the monument and tomb to King Suryavarman II, breaks the tradition of Hindu Shaivism. The temple was built with a different organization and orientation, breaking all of the Khmer culture's rules. Or at least, so it seemed to the unwise eye of the Western scholars who tried to unravel its mysteries. Angkor Wat stands witness to the new religious ideology of the Khmer civilization, for it is a symbol of Vaishnavism. It seems as if Surya Varman II's reign came as a turning point for the whole Khmer Empire. Angkor Wat stands on 162.6 hectares of land, making it the world's largest religious monument. King Suryavarman II began its construction during the 12th century, but it was not completed in his lifetime. The central piece of the temple, the now lost statue of Vishnu, was erected in July 1131. Scholars believe this occurred on the king's 33rd birthday, a number with significant cosmic meaning in Hinduism, as there are 33 Vedic deities. The statue was found under the southern tower. It was probably moved outside by Buddhists, who still occupy the temple. Angkor Wat is unlike any other Cambodian temple and bears a veil of mystery. For starters, its doors face to the west, 
while the rest of the temples are oriented toward the east. This difference might be because Angkor Wat was originally dedicated to Vishnu, who is often associated with the west. Cambodia's previous main deity, Shiva, is associated with the east, and all other temples are therefore east-oriented. And if one is to follow the bas-relief that spreads more than a mile around the temple's outer walls, one would have to start moving counterclockwise, starting from the northwestern corner of the temple. All other temples follow a clockwise orientation when it comes to reading the bas-reliefs, which would always keep the relief on the person's right side. This custom is even known in Sanskrit under the name Pradakshina. The modern word for the West also means to sink or to drown, leading some scholars to believe that the primary function of Angkor Wat was to be a tomb. George Coday, a French scholar, was the first to suggest that Angkor Wat's orientation to the West might be connected to Vishnu, not death. But he did not deny it could also be a tomb, as it does contain several receptacles that perhaps functioned as sarcophagi. The original name of Angkor Wat is unknown, as the foundation steel was never found. It is also odd that none of the contemporary inscriptions of Cambodia refer to this temple. Its modern name, Angkor Wat, means Temple City or City of Temples. Some scholars believe the old name may have been Bara Vishnulak or Ra Vishnulak, as the temple was dedicated to Vishnu and King Suryavarman II. The king's posthumous name was Parama Vishnulaka, which means the king who has gone to the supreme world of Vishnu. Angkor Wat was not investigated in detail by scholars until the 1980s. This delay can be attributed to World War II, the Cambodian Civil War, and the Khmer Rouge, the latter cut off the temple from the rest of the world. But the people who were allowed access brought back images and written descriptions, allowing scientists and scholars insight into the mysteries of Cambodia. Eleanor Manika started her study of the temple's dimensions in the mid-1970s based on existing photographs of Angkor Wat. She concluded that these numbers correspond to the four ages of the world, or Yuga in Sanskrit. The first in the Yuga cycle is Satya Yuga, the golden age in which the gods rule the people. It lasts for 1,728,000 years. The second one is Treta Yuga, a period in which Vishnu's three avatars would be seen. It lasts for 1,296,000 years. Devapara Yuga, the age of compassion and truthfulness, is the third yuga lasting 864,000 years. The fourth and last period is Kali Yuga, in which strife and quarrel rule. The last yuga is why this period bears the name of the demon Kali. It lasts for 432,000 years. According to Hinduism, we are living in Kali Yuga at the moment. Once it ends, the world as we know it will be destroyed and rebuilt into a new golden age, and the cycle will repeat. The distance one must traverse from the main entrance to the central statue of Vishnu coincides with the Yuga cycle and the stages one must metaphorically go through in life. Since west is seen as the direction in which the dead walk, going the opposite direction along the west-east axis means moving back in time. Thus, one would be approaching the golden age according to Hinduism. Suppose an observer stands at the western entrance on the summer solstice morning. In that case, he will see that the sun rises precisely above the temple's central tower, which is interesting since Suryavarman II's name means protected by the sun. Another exciting conclusion modern astronomers have come to is that on any other day, the sunrise aligned with the axis between the western gate and a small hill to the northeast named Phnom Bok. Modern scholars compared the magnificence and architecture of Angkor Wat to the temples of ancient Greece or Rome. The primary building material in the 12th century was sandstone, and the whole temple was built with sandstone blocks. The binding for the blocks still intrigues scholars, as it is unknown what they used. Some think slaked lime was used, while others propose natural resins. The temple is typical for Khmer architecture, consisting of lotus bud-shaped towers, the Ogaville Half Galleries, and broad passageways. Angkor Wat stands on a platform raised above what was once a city. It has three galleries rising to the central tower. Each level is higher than the previous one, and they were maybe even dedicated to the king, the moon, and Vishnu. However, the main decorative elements of the temple are the bas-reliefs that depict narrative scenes, garlands, and devatas. Unfortunately, many of these elements were destroyed during the civil wars in Cambodia or by looters. 
The inner wall of the outer gallery depicts the scenes from the Ramayana and Rahabharata. The western gallery displays the Battle of Lanka from the former and the Battle of Kurukshetra from the latter. On the other hand, the southern gallery wall shows a historical scene. The procession of Suryavarman II, followed by the 32 hells and 37 heavens of the Hindu religion. The eastern gallery displays one of the most famous scenes, the Samudra Mantam, the churning of the sea of milk. In this scene, Vishnu instructs 92 Asuras and 88 Devas to churn the sea by using the body of Vasuki, a serpent king. By the 15th century, the Khmer Empire was in decline. The empire would shift from Hinduism to Buddhism, depending on the religious views of the kings who succeeded the Angkor throne. Zhou Deguan, a Chinese emissary to Angkor, wrote in the 13th century about several rituals and practices in Angkor. The specifics of how Angkor fell and was abandoned between Zhu's visit to Angkor and a king named Chan, who restored some old temples during the 1550s and 1560s, are muddy. The centuries in between witnessed significant shifts in the Angkor economy, language, foreign relations, and the structure of Cambodian society. Angkor Wat underwent restoration works in 1986 and 1992 and is undergoing various reconstruction projects, but is mainly a tourist attraction. The Cambodian government protects the site, which became a part of the UNESCO World Heritage List in 1992. In 2018, the temple saw 7,300 tourists every day of the year, making it a total of 2.6 million people. Luckily, there are no examples of tourists damaging the site, except for a few cases of graffiti. To protect the temple, the Cambodian government invested in ropes and wooden steps over the extremely steep stone steps. Approximately 28% of the ticket revenue is reserved for temple maintenance. At least five tourists per year are caught taking nude photographs on the site of Angkor Wat, and for that, they are immediately deported from Cambodia for breaking the moral values of this Buddhist state. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history? Impress your friends and predict the future more accurately based on past events. If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about Angkor Wat, check out our book, The Khmer Empire, a captivating guide to the merged kingdoms of Cambodia that became the Angkor Empire that ruled over most of mainland Southeast Asia and parts of southern China. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.